Um, the last part of this workshop, besides the forum, which is happening at the end, uh, we tried to think, what would you need that we haven't given you yet? And first, we just wanted to let you see the impact on individual students, because often teachers, amazingly, don't hear student voices. You're in the classroom with them every day, but you don't really get to hear what they think about stuff. And we would argue it's because we're not asking them questions. We're teaching them. Um, and so I wanted you to see them. And then I asked them, what part of choice theory and Murray do you think they need to see? And that's what you just saw, the second thing. And for, so what did they pick? Relationships. You know, they wanted to show how taking time at Murray that would normally be spent doing curriculum was instead spent getting to know each other. And that for them, if that isn't done, the rest doesn't follow. That's their number one thing at Murray. That, that's what they thought was the most important aspect. Um, so then I thought, what's the next thing that needs to be done? And that is to show you that although this works very well in individual classrooms, it works really well in a school as a whole. So if you can get a school where everybody's trying this, it's just like it just takes off. So I wanted you to start with this um, chart. Uh, and I didn't get myself one. Let's see. Um, so everybody's got one of these charts. My, student, my principal just created this for use with the school board in our area. And um, what this shows, if you take a look at it, these are just test scores, which we would say are not all that important to us. But actually, they've helped us survive. Because as a small school with all the budget cuts that everybody goes through, um, because they started up with these tests and because we just wipe them away, I mean, they're just, we do so great on these tests with students who were failing everything before they came to us, they don't want to cut our school now because they can hold this up and say, look how great the school is doing. Um, but we would say they're missing 99% of what we're doing. But anyway, it shows up in these test scores. So. If you look at, it started in 1998 is when the, that kind of testing started in uh, America, or at least in Virginia. And we were scoring pretty low. Like, look at that. Right? Um, and this, we found out, actually we got put on probation by the state for that math score, as you can imagine. And they sent a team out there to work with us. And the team said, we just want you to know that we know whenever a school gets underneath 20 percentile passing, it means they're choosing the wrong answers on purpose. Because statistically, you can't get below 20% unless you know the right answers to not answer. Right? So they said, this means your kids are protesting. Right? So we did not doubt that at all. Because you could see the attitudes of kids going into the testing. Like, this is stupid. Why are they making me do stuff that it doesn't matter to me? Da, da, da. I mean, very grumbly about it. And so. When we saw all of this, we called a big community meeting, and we put the scores out there for them to see, and they were published in the newspaper. That's how they do it in America. So they could see all the other schools, and they could see us. And we said, OK, so we put a bunch of tables in the middle, and we asked for 12 volunteers. And we said, you're the school board, and tonight you have to decide how to spend your money. So you've got four, four high schools. And four of them, three of them are doing pretty well, like in the 70th at least percentile. And then you've got this one. Who are you going to give the money to? And then we shut up and let them talk. And the rest of the students are listening and they, they can hear the kids who are playing the school board like, well, how can we justify keeping the school open? Look at these scores. If we just took these 120 kids and spread them out over all the schools, you wouldn't see these rotten scores. We could get rid of them. And that really sank home to the kids. And so then we as teachers said, do you like your school enough to deal with the testing? Because it, you could sink the school by choosing to continue to do this in tests. You know? And they said, well, we like the school, we hate the tests. We said, okay, we buy that, but we're a state school. You can come here for free, and the state's requiring this. You know, that's reality. So now what? We can't get rid of them. We can't avoid them. So what are we going to do? How can we handle them? And they said, could we have breakfast on test days? And we said, are you kidding? Of course, breakfast is fun. So on test days, we have breakfast. Everybody sits down together. We have pancakes and bacon. And you know, we just sit down and have. We don't do that every single test day. We do it like at the beginning of the testing cycle. And then, but we do have like juice and toast and bagels and things like that on every test day. 
So you're kind of celebrated when you do tests. Um, and then we asked them, what do you, they said, we have one more request besides food. <laughs> and we said, okay, what's your request? They said that you still do fun classes, that you don't just teach the test all the time and have nothing but practice tests and da da da. You know, we'll, we want to still have fun, hands-on learning that means something to us. And if you can guarantee that, then we'll do our best on the tests. And we said, that sounds fair. So that's what we've done. And you can see the test results are pretty awesome. Um, especially if you notice 2001, which is the little light green one, that's when we became a Glasser Quality School. That's the year we declared our uh, becoming a Glasser Quality School and where we began to institute all the aspects of a Glasser Quality School. And you can see how they've stayed up ever since then. Um, our goal last year was to have at least 95% pass rate and everything, and as you can see, we hit that. Um, went beyond it in some areas. Actually, you can't see in English, there are two English tests, but um, the writing was 100%. And this doesn't show your advanced pass rates either, and our goal was 50% advanced pass rate, and we hit 58% in English. I'm an English teacher, so I'll, show, I'll smile a little bit about that. Um, but we hit very close to that, like in the 40s, advanced passes, which means very high level um, pass rate for um, in all the subject areas in the 40s. So the testing is something that comes along with the rest of the Glasser ideas in a quality school. Um, so I'll put that away if you would. And so I have made for everybody a CD. And there's a lot of stuff on the CD. I Try to think of everything that you might need or you could look at. And you've got a little sheet like this. Does everybody have one? It just tells you what's on the CD and the page numbers you can find it. And then I, I'm going to go over some of that with you in this um, so you'll know what you've got, actually. And I also put in a whole bunch of extra goodies, which is on the last year. I just kept adding stuff that I thought you might be able to use. Um, and one of the first things that I... Uh, when I was thinking this through, I thought, what is it that makes our school work that another school could do? And I think you got another sheet from me, did you? What else have you got? Yeah. Only those two? Oh, yeah. no, okay, so it's on your CD, and it's here. I sat down and I started thinking, what are all the support systems at our school? Like, what exactly does a Glasser Quality School do to support teachers, students, and parents and administrators? How do we do it? And so I came up with this list. Um, we have a choices program, and I'm going to spend some time showing you what that is, and you kind of heard kids talking about it a little bit. Um, in a nutshell, it means that you're never in trouble. You're just making choices that need to be worked out if they're not the kind of choices that lead to learning in a classroom. So how do you handle that? Uh, and there's a choices teacher. I'm a choices teacher, and there are a bunch of other choices teachers at Murray, and we help students and teachers think through the choices that they're making. Um, second thing is mediations, and that's uh, used between students, but it's also between students and teachers. And that's a really shocking thing to all students and all teachers who first come to Murray, because they've never been asked to sit down with a student and explain why they were having trouble with them in a class. And usually teachers, when they first come to Murray, will say, I'm the teacher. I know what happened. I know what that kid did. I don't need to work anything out with them. You know, that's their problem. They need to do X, Y, or Z. And we say, okay, except at Murray, we've agreed to mediate. And we would say, if that student's doing that in your classroom, it's because there's a misunderstanding going on that needs to get worked out. Would you be willing to explain what you want? Just sit down and say, what, what do you need from the student? He knows what I need, or she knows what I need. Would you be willing to just tell him, just to tell him in a friendly way, what do you need? And what the teachers find is when they actually sit down across a table with a third party, the student begins to see them as a human. <coughs> and they begin to see the students as a human. And that, I'm the teacher, you're the kid, kind of drifts away. After a few months of doing mediations, what's the point of that? It's kind of a, uh, an aggressive kind of a thing. That's the way kids see it. And if you back off from that, then there's understanding happening between teachers and students. So we don't have a single teacher now that would not want to mediate. 
Um, but the kids like it that it's a requirement. It's a non-negotiable at Murray for all people to mediate. So if a kid comes into class and he's blaming or into choices, he's blaming the teacher, you know, that teacher did this, that teacher did that, then after letting them let off a little steam and suggesting a mediation, I ask them if they heard themselves using those red behaviors that you've got cards on. And almost always they can look at my classrooms, I've got them all posted, and they can go, yeah, I was blaming the teacher. <laughs> I go, oh, okay, so you heard that. Yeah, I was blaming them. I said, okay, if they were in here, what would they be saying? How would they be talking about it with you? you know, what would they say had happened from their perspective? And so we just ask them to shift gears into what is, what is the teacher feeling? And they never thought of that before. They never really thought of a teacher having feelings. You know, you're this thing in the front of the room making them do things they don't want to do. I mean, that's kind of where kids are with teachers. And so they start shifting gears into looking again as, at you as a human. And they realize they don't want to hurt you. They want to learn from you. They don't, they don't mean to disrespect you exactly. They're not sure how to do it in a different way. And so it's a, an opportunity for them to think it through. And mediations, uh, we would not give them up for anything. I mean, there's actually a joke that if there was ever a fight in the area, Murray kids would run with their notebooks to take notes as to what was going on um, because they, they wouldn't do the fight, fight, fight thing. And that's why they were laughing so much because at a regular high school in America, and, and I hope it doesn't happen here, whenever there's a fight, kids stand around and try to encourage the fight. You know, and teachers have to break through the kids who are approving the action of beating each other up in order to get to the kids who are, are doing the fighting. So at Murray, that, that's... And we're still sure that they can film it now with their with the camera things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Put it on YouTube. Right? Absolutely. Uh huh. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. So that's another support system we've got, and then one that the students really love, and the teachers actually love it too, is something called a five-minute walk. And we had to petition the school board when we first opened to get that because they said, "Are you kidding? I'd be chaos." A school where kids just get to get up and walk around for five minutes. You don't know where they are, what they're doing, what are you talking about? And we said, well, if we can manage it and it isn't chaos, can we have it? And they said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll see. We'll give it six months. And we said, oh, can we have six months? Six months to try it out. And we still have it 20 years later because we, when kids abuse it, we sit them down in choices and we say, okay, do you like five-minute walks? And they all say, yeah. We say, okay, then could you tell me what is a five-minute walk and why do we all value them? Why do you like them? Well, because it's a five-minute walk is the time where if I'm fidgety in class and I don't want to disrespect everybody, I can just take five minutes and go get a drink and, you know, maybe sit down and talk with a friend for a couple minutes and I have to be back by five minutes ready to work. So that's it. That's a perfect definition of what a five-minute walk is. So have you been doing that? Is that how you're managing five-minute walks? Long silence. I go, not exactly. I go, do you think the rest of Murray students would be happy with you if because of abusing five-minute walks, we all lose them? Because the school board says, obviously, we can't manage it. They wouldn't like me very much if that happened. Say, okay, so you're putting all of us in a spot when you do that, and we just wanted to reflect that to you. I mean, what could you do instead? What do you need if the five-minute walk isn't working for you and you're taking 20 minutes? What do you need? Do you have a plan to graduate? Do you think you can graduate hanging out in the hall for 20 minutes with teachers who don't trust you because they're looking all around for you? Is that going to help you graduate or not? It isn't. So, okay, so what do you need? How can we help you? And so that kind of a conversation unplugs their irresponsibility. You know, when they, they're not taking ownership of it because nobody's asked them. So we ask them. You know, we, we reflect back to them, what is it that, and do you value it, and how can you keep it? Um, Second thing, the fourth thing is putting yourself in choices, and I, I just love that. What that means is choices is a program that kids could see as a discipline program at Murray, except they get to put themselves there whenever they need to. And so a lot of people, when they first hear that, is so what if you've got 300 kids that all want to sit in choices all day? That never has happened. What happens is kids will tell you the truth, like somebody like the kid Shannon was acting out today, might say, I need, to, I need to go to Choices. And we'd say, great, thank you. You know, that's them telling us what they need. They, they're taking ownership of what they need. And when they get to Choices, one of us who's up there can say, okay, what's going on today? 
And a lot of times we'll find out horrible things that were going on at home that nobody could have gone through a school day having that on their back. I mean, terrible things happened. I had a kid who came up to me one day, and I'm sure you've all got stories like this, and he was just shaking, and he said, I need to put myself in choices. And when we got up there, I said, can I help you in some way? He said, I don't know, but I'm afraid to go home tonight. And I said, how come? He started crying. He said, this morning, my mom's gotten involved with some new man, and he got drunk last night, and this morning at about 5 a.m., he got us all out of bed, and he started chasing us around the woods outside of our house with a gun. And I thought he was going to kill my mom and my sister and me. So I got my sister and me away, and the two of us got on school buses. I don't know where my mom is. I don't know what's going on, and I don't know if I should go home tonight. My God, we were expecting that kid to just go through the school day and turn the pages and do the stuff and, you know, be polite and get along with everybody with us not having the slightest idea what he was dealing with. You know, so the choices, putting yourself in choices helps hand the responsibility to them and say, what do you need to be happy in this school? What do you need to learn? Whatever it is, we're strong enough to figure it out together. We're a team. We'll figure it out. And so you learn a lot of things about your students you wouldn't have learned otherwise, but they get help, too, because of that, because you're learning those things. Um, you've heard me say ramps, commitments, that's all on your, um, your CD. Also, what are ramps, commitments? We hand out at the, in the first week that we do all the what is Murray kind of stuff and team building and, and all that. We all, including teachers and bus drivers and custodians and everyone involved in the school, do a little ceremony where we sign these ramps commitments. And it's just an um, acronym that kids came up with, and um, they were laughing because they wanted to add courage recently, and it would be cramps. <laughs> and so <laughs> they all think that's funny. We'll never live that one down. Um, and they did add courage to the title of it now, that you would do your ramps commitments with courage and determination. R is respect each other, yourself, and the environment. Uh, a is to attend regularly, M is to mediate when necessary, P is to participate actively, and S is to share your gifts with the community. So a lot of times kids will say to each other, are you living up to your Rams commitments? You know, when somebody's treating it like you saw in the, um, in the skit on bullying. You know, that's not, that's not what we said we do in Rams. Right? So it's just another conversation that we can have. It's a way to ask each other if you're living up to ramps. And when a teacher loses it in a classroom and gets an attitude toward a kid, like they go, Hans, cut that up. You know, see so that, that physical glaring, taking a step toward them, pointing kind of thing that teachers sometimes do. You know, they have an opportunity to talk about that with the student because the student will often call them to a mediation. And they will say, when you step toward me, and you stare at me, and you point in my face, I get really upset. I have a hard time not doing it back to you, or not telling you F you, or you know, something like that. Please don't talk to me like that. I'm very sensitive to attitudes. You know, it would really help me from my teacher if you could talk to me calmly, and don't point in my face, or you know, something like that. And so they, they, and the t kid would say, you know, that doesn't feel like R in ramps to me. It doesn't feel like respect. It's just another discussion that we can have. Um, can't see the next one. Oh, class meetings. Uh, it's just a time to get together in class. We do them as regularly as we can and see how's it going. Is everybody happy in this class? How's it working? <laughs> uh, we pause momentarily. It could be 20 minutes and maybe the teacher brings everybody something fun to eat or kids do and we just kind of say hi to each other and just, I call it taking your temperature. You know, where are we? Are we sick? Are we happy or healthy? Where are we? Um, and then if, if we find that we are not healthy and there's a bad feeling in the room and there's a lot of long silences and people aren't comfortable with each other, that's great to know. I mean, as a teacher, it's not your fault that your class is in that situation. It's just, and this is another thing I love Glasser about, he says it's a system problem. All that's telling you, if there are bad feelings in your class, there's something in the system that needs to be tinkered with. And you as a team can tinker with it. You have all the power in the world. Tinker with it until you're happy. So keep playing around with it. And that's what a class mediation is. So if it's really bad in the room and you as a teacher are feeling like you're all by yourself in a room full of banshees or whatever, then you just call a class mediation. It's another level of support at Murray. And 
I'll come in or uh, our principal will come in. She's very good at it. Our spe one of our special ed teachers is really good at it. And we'll just run a class mediation, which basically means we'll go around the room and the teacher just sits in among the students and we'll say, what's working in this class right now? And saying nothing isn't okay. It's a non-negotiable. Something's working. What's working? And so as everyone goes around the room and they have to come up with something that's working, pretty soon you see there are a lot of things working in this class, a lot of things. And then you say, okay, great. So now as we go around the room, what would you like to see working a little better? And do you have an idea? How could we improve it? What needs to be improved and how could we improve it? And so they need to be very concrete and they go around the room and they're extremely respectful. And if they aren't, I would just say, please take a five minute walk. It's very easy. Just say to a student, please take a five minute walk. If they say, I hate the teacher, she's a blank. I'd say, please take a five minute walk. And everyone in class would know it was because he used a red behavior on the teacher and it's not polite. And so he'd get five minutes, he'd come back and jump right back in and keep right on going and he's not in trouble. He's not evil, he's not bad. He just gave himself permission to use red behavior and we had agreed not to do that. So now he comes back, he's still part of the group. And by the end we have a plan and we write that plan down. Now it's something concrete that they can try in this class to see if it works. And my job is to check back in once in a while and say, how's your class mediation plan working? Are you happy with it? Is it going okay? Do you need another class mediation? What kind of support do you need now as a class? And almost always the kids go, oh, it's a lot better. We, we don't have any problems. I go, okay. Because it was just the act of sitting down and taking ownership of it instead of blaming the teacher or the teacher blaming the kids. Kids today are so, uh, no, instead of that, Everybody took ownership of what the issues were and tried to do something about it and made suggestions. So it takes the, the pain out of it for everybody. So that's another level of um, support. And, and let me stop right there. Have you got questions? That was a lot to throw at you. Yes, ma'am. I'll be sure that they're safe when they're on the five minute walk because they're not maybe taking jokes or, or something like that because we're, we're responsible. Let me ask you a question. In your school, are kids allowed to take a break to go to the bathroom? Yeah, but they, they bring, uh, they have it open and we sign it before they go away. Okay, so um, you're saying you would need some way to know where they are, like that they have gone on a bathroom break? Well, just to so ensure that they're safe or they're not doing anything. They shouldn't be doing. But if they sign in or out, does that mean they're not doing drugs in the bathroom? No, it doesn't, but I was just wondering. We would say it's just like giving someone a break to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's that amount of freedom. But they can, maybe they don't have to go to the bathroom during that break. They can go, and, and we would want them to be doing some thinking. Mm -hmm. And they know they're not allowed to go outside during a five minute walk, unless they, if they really feel like they need to go on a walk around the building, like they're really stressed out for whatever and they need some energy, they can knock on the door and say, Ms. Wellen, I need to go on a walk around the building or write off some <coughs> energy. And I will call around and find somebody who's willing to help them do that if I'm teaching or, or whatever. If we can do that, we will. You know, if we can't, I'll say, I'm sorry, I can't find anybody to help you with that right now, and you can't go by yourself, so what could you do to handle this? How could we help you handle it? Again, I hand it back to them. So what do you need? And almost always they'll say, could I just sit in the cubby, have a little cubby hole, like a staircase little area, could I just sit in the cubby hole for five minutes and kind of cool off and... So, and I'll say, do you need to talk to somebody? And then, no, I think I got it handled. I go, okay, you know you don't have to handle everything by yourself. They say, I know, but I got this, okay. I said, all right, mm -hmm. how will I know you're okay? Because in five minutes, I'll come back and get down to work. So, okay. You know somebody in, in one of the who talks the one who's available? Well, we have our guidance counselor. We're a small school, and mostly everybody's teaching. Mm -hmm. Like, even I, I'm the choice of teacher, but I'm teaching. Mm -hmm almost all day, all the time. After school, I have an AP class, and after that, I had the Ireland fix. I mean, I'm pretty busy, but it doesn't matter. I'll still meet them at the door and see how you're doing and what do you need and what can I do to help you. And if somebody needs more support than I can give, or maybe they can just come in my room and sit down and have a nice couch and lamp and magazines and stuff in there, and they, I'll say, you want to sit in here for a little while? <coughs> I go, yeah. And so they come in and sit down. Our goal is, are they safe? I mean, that's a big question. If someone is really like pacing and hysterical, I don't want them in my classroom, obviously. And I would say to them, if they met me at the door, 
you don't look like you're safe to me. You look really upset, so I'm going to get some more support for you. And I call up to the office and say, we need somebody to help this student. But most of the time, even when they are pacing like that, when I give them the choice of, can you calm down? If I gave you five minutes sitting here at this table, could you calm down? They almost always say, yeah, I could. I'm just really mad. Okay. You know, so again, just ask them. We ask them. And you'll hear in my voice, I'm not asking them with an attitude, at least on my good days. <laughs> I'm not. So I'm not saying, what do you need? <laughs> you know, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm really interested in what you need, and I'm really listening. I care what you need, because I know if you can tell me, it helps you handle it, and it helps me help you handle it. You know? And if I get an attitude, I, I now have to do a whole lot more work to ever get you back to where you'd be willing to talk to me about it again. The five-minute walk is like a re relief for the psychological bladder. Yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> Trust Brian to come up with a good enough. Yeah. When you say you, you put you, the, the child themselves or the student says, I, I think I need to go to choices, is that a, a place in the school or is that somewhere? Not exactly. It's kind of a mental place. Okay. I mean, I have the word choices outside of my door, so they kind of identify me with choices. But if I'm teaching, they always have to go up in the front and register that they have put themselves in choices. And then the secretary up front will usually call me and say, do you have room for choices people in your room? And usually I'll say yes. You know, but if not, then the principal will have time or the guidance counselor will have time or any teacher who's free has a free period at that time, they might take the student and help them. I mean, it's really just, they're not in trouble. And when they first arrive there, especially if they got sent to choices, nobody likes to be sent anywhere. They're like, I'm being punished, I don't you know. And you have to help them talk that through. You know, really, what, what's the punishment? They sent me out of class. I go, okay, so you want to be in class? Well, yeah. Okay, so why do you think the teacher chose to send you? What were the issues on the table, do you know? And if they say, I have no idea why that teacher sent me out, I go, okay, that's good. Maybe one thing we can write down here is the teacher could be more clear about what they are expecting in class. Is that what you want to tell them? Well, so, so did the teacher let you know that the next thing might be choices if you didn't stop whatever it was? Well, yeah, but I didn't think she was going to really do it. Oh, okay, so the teacher was pretty clear. Well, yeah, kind of clear. So if you didn't want to be sent, and the teacher was clear that you were about to be sent, what options did you have as a student? Well, I could have stopped doing it. <laughs> I could have moved away from my friend. I could have put myself in choices. I could have taken a final work. Yeah, you could have done any of those things, but you didn't. So next time, those are your options. This time, the teacher called you on it, kind of. Because in the, build, in the classroom, her job or his job is to make sure it's a safe learning environment and everybody's focused on learning. And clearly what you did, the teacher didn't feel that way. You know, well, everyone else was talking too. Go, okay, but who's here now? Well, I am, but that teacher has it in for me. Oh, okay, you need to mediate with the teacher and tell her you feel like she's got it in for you because if she does, that's not a safe learning environment for you. So maybe she needs to hear that you feel that way. Well, I don't really need to do that. Okay, okay, so if I hear that again, I'm probably going to think you need to mediate and, and we'll set that up. But otherwise, I'm going to assume you got to handle it. Okay. And then they make a plan. I call the teacher and say, they have a plan. They <coughs> seem to be ready to come back to class and handle it. Do you want them back? I always ask the teacher that because sometimes what they've told me and what the teacher thinks happened are very different. Like the teacher might have said, did they tell you that they said F you to everybody and slam the door and stalk, <laughs> stalk down the hall? No, they didn't say that. And so I'll turn to them, and they'll already be laughing with, I left that part out, sorry. <laughs> uh -huh. So now we have to start this plan over again. It's a little different now. You know, but usually the teacher will say, sure, send them back. And we try again. So they're not sitting for days in some in-school suspension room or being det in a detention at lunch or, you know, none of that. They're handling the problem and going back. And a lot of Murray kids will tell me over time that that's one of the most refreshing things about Murray to them is that, when you get into some kind of conflict with someone, you solve it and it's over. And usually in their lives, that has never been the case. You know, often in their lives, people don't talk to each other for days in their family or they scream at each other in the family and the kids are slamming doors and the parents are slamming doors and so there isn't 
a, a way to let go of that. It just kind of builds until explosions happen. Yeah. Is that mean is that we're in agreement though to work in Choices Room? Obviously it's their own time that they run this Choices Room. Right. So is it a prerequisite in the context of teachers and all the rest of the staff? No, the not at all. But we have zero, zero turnover at our school. Nobody, all the teachers say, this is my last job. I'm going to be here forever. Sure. You'll have to figure that out financially. I mean, who is willing to do it and who isn't? And if you have the money to pay them, you know. I mean, my principal's always looking for a way to pay me more, which is a nice position to be in. And she never has any money. And I always say, forget it, it doesn't matter. I mean, for me, I, you can't get more payment than working with these kids and seeing the kind of stuff they do. I mean, I can't believe anybody pays me anything for that. You know, it's amazing. It's really wonderful. But if you're trying to set up a school with teachers who are really concerned about that, then you as a staff have to figure out what can you afford. You know, I mean, one of the things we have afforded this year is we took a little bit more from that instructional money, which we didn't have, and we hired a full-time teacher's aide, like just a teaching assistant, someone right out of college or out of high school, I guess, out of high school, who's just there as like if I need someone to mediate, let's say we have a student who wants to mediate with you and you're teaching class right now, I might call you and say there's a teacher, a student who's requested mediation, is there a time in your class that I could send the teacher's aid to you? And you'd say, yeah, they're all going to be working at the last 20 minutes of class. And I'd go, okay. And then I'd find the teacher's aid and say, are you available the last 20 minutes of class so we can mediate? So we decided to have someone that, that could take those parts and we decided to pay for that. So, again, it's up to your school what you can pay for and what the teachers feel comfortable with. Yes, sir? Do you have repeat offenders and choices? Constantly, sure, <laughs> because it's habit. I mean, these are habitual behaviors they have developed over time to survive a system that wasn't working for them. So it's hard for them to let go of those behaviors because they haven't really thought it through. They don't know why they're doing this. They just think, you know, this is who I am, and they say that. I mean, I had a kid come in, he had a cut from here to here that was just like oozing and disgusting and it was obviously had been down to the bone. And he pulls up his shirt and he says, you see that cut? I said, yeah. He said, I did that to myself. You're going to have trouble with me this year. And I said, okay, that's a pretty good sized cut. What happened? And he said, well, my dad was beating up my mom and he wouldn't stop and so I picked up a knife in the kitchen and I said, it's you or me. And then I realized... I better not cut my dad, and so I cut my arm. And I cut it to the bone. I said, well, I guess that stopped the argument, didn't it? And he said, yeah, everyone had to take me to the hospital. I said, that was pretty smart. I said, I don't really know if I were making that choice, if I would have thought to cut myself instead of somebody else. Especially in a situation like that, I think you had a heck of a lot of willpower. I don't know I would have had that same amount of willpower. You know, that's pretty amazing. And so he, that was like, it broke, I wasn't shocked and I wasn't angry and I wasn't blaming, like, you're a bad kid, I didn't buy his little excuse that, well, and there's nothing we can do about it and there's just his evidence, you know, none of that is true. He was in a bad spot and he's been in a bad spot in his life a lot and this was survival stuff he'd done. Am I going to have a repeat uh, offender? Absolutely, because I want to see him every day if I can. Because the more he hears this stuff, the more chance we've got to break through that garbage he's been saying about, I hate school, I hate teachers, I hate adults, I da 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 da. You know, he is can. There time, is there time yes. Limit? No. Really, the time limit is um, well, at the end of the school year, the teachers all meet to say, who needs more support? Who is this clearly working for now and clearly not working for now? And one of my jobs over the summer was to meet with all of those students, and there were, uh, out of 120, there were eight or nine <coughs> that we felt just weren't getting it at all, and the repeat offender part was not improving. We weren't seeing growth happening, and so I met with each one of them and made a really complex, clear plan with all of them, and this year we're trying again. So, you know, but now we have this big plan, and every time we sit down with the plan and say, okay, which part of the plan is working and which part isn't, no. And we're not mad at them. Again, we're still working with them. As long as they will stay in school, we'll keep working with them. And I you know? found the elastic stretch. Can <laughs> Say that again? I found the elastic stretch. Somewhere along the line, is there, is, is, there, is there an end game? Well, if somebody brings a submachine gun to school, that's about the end of that. I mean... It and would it really take that? Or do you say we, we can do nothing here? 
Um, if, if we felt, and it's happened a couple of times, but not very often, if we felt that that person is unsafe, like I'll give you an example of a student who um, was, was talking, that telling stories in class that he heard voices and that they were telling him to kill people and things like that. We heard this from kids, we heard this from teachers. And we met with his parents and we highly suggested that they put him in some kind of counseling that where he's locked up and getting some treatment. But they were a poor family and in America, I don't know what it's like here, hopefully not like that, there's no support for that family. There's no way to get that kid any support because his family couldn't pay for it, the school won't pay for it, the government won't pay for it. He's not getting it. So we decided as a faculty that even though it broke our hearts, we didn't think it was safe to have him there. And we highly recommended they get counseling. They didn't afford it. He went to the regular school. He murdered someone, and he's on death row right now. And that we saw that happen. We saw it coming miles away, and nothing we could do. I saw that hand. I've been trying to get to you. Sorry. Yes, sir. I'm just worried about child protection and safeguarding issues, because it did seem to be Right, right. We have those same duties. You know, we let kids know up front, if you tell us things that are illegal, hurtful to yourself or to someone else, we are going to support you by getting help, period. But the reality is, we can try to get help all we want. America is a disaster area as far as helping kids. It's just no, there, there's nothing there to support them. And so, I mean, even uh, like a young girl called me over the summer and said, my mother is drunk all the time and she's smacking me constantly. I cannot stop her smacking me. I'm going to do something horrible if I don't get out of this house. We're locked in a house in a farmyard, just the two of us, and she's out of control, and I, I don't know what to do. And so I said, would she bring you in over the summer to work with me on something? And she said, sure, she'll drop me off at school. I said, okay. So her mom drops her off at school, and she says, I want to call social services. I said, okay. We call social services. The guy comes over from social services, and he looks at her. And he said, well, you don't, you're not bleeding. You don't have a broken arm. You don't have a broken nose. You don't have black eyes. It's your word against hers, and I have to call her and tell her that you called me. Okay, so that's the boat we were in. That was it. That's what we got for calling them. And she said, do you mean that I have to be in the hospital, basically, before you will help me? And he said, yeah. And that was the truth. Because about a year later, she broke her arm, and she got help, and she got put in a foster family. But it was because she had a broken arm. So things are messed up, pretty messed up in that respect. So what do we do as teachers? We just, we're glad when they let us know, and we do the best we can with what we have to work with. So but that's a lot. Um, all right, let me go on here. So these are a lot of the support systems. I'm going to go a little bit more through there. Number eight is family mediations. Uh, that came about from students requesting and parents requesting to use the systems that work at Murray with their family. Uh, and I just did a family mediation with one of the kids who was here this week um, because she did something at home that they were outraged about and they took the trip away from her. And so she called me on a Sunday, hysterical, and said, I'm running away. They took the trip away. I will never forgive them ever. You know, I know what I did was stupid, but I will never forgive them for that. And I just want you to know I love you guys, and I'm running away. Went, okay. <laughs> this is like we have five days before we leave. And so I called the family and said, you know, she's obviously upset. You're probably upset. Would you be willing to come in and sit down and talk? And they said, yeah, we don't know what to do with her. I mean, she's hysterical. We're hysterical. Yeah. And so they came in on, in an evening and they sat together and they worked it out. They came up with a plan and here she is. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really wonderful system when things break down at home. Um, and we were afraid at first that it would be considered family counseling. We don't counsel, we just write the plan up. I mean, it's just a mediation. You come in, you talk to each other, we write the plan. That's really all it is. We give you a safe environment. And I have had some parents come in and try to use violence at the table, like get mad, try to throw the table or whatever, and I just say, okay, the mediation's obviously over until you can calm down. And when the kids see that I will tell a father that, you know, that helps because they see that dad who's been acting like a demon at home 
can get himself together and can come back in and sit down in five minutes and do a mediation, darn it, and he did. You know, just the only thing that was different is I asked him to do it and he wanted to, so he did. You know, he handled it. So those are, are very useful uh, things to do in a school. We also offer a parent support group which meets one night uh, every month. And usually we have 15 or 20 parents show up and I teach choice theory and we have other teachers who come in and teach various aspects of this and uh, they just share with each other what it's like to have a troubled teenager at home and it's usually really hard and so they get a chance to, to talk that out with each other and come up with methods that they can uh, use. We also have community meetings which they told you about, um, mastery learning which you know about um, and for us, that's never admitting defeat academically. I mean, ever. We will never admit defeat. We'll never give you an F. We'll never say it's okay to turn in mediocre work. We will always say, what well, can we do to help you get better? And so far, every single kid that we've ever worked with at Murray wants to get better. Everyone. They may not think they can. They may be acting out as if they never intend to ever do it. But when it gets down to it, even some 17-year-old big guy who never admits to anything will break down in tears and say, I don't want to get out of school and not be able to read and write. Because they don't. But it's hard to say that in a lot of environments. So we create an environment for them to do that. Um, could you scroll down a little bit for me? Um, we created some courses that help everybody learn choice theory. Most students get through English through leadership. The job of that class is to transform form Murray into a happier place. That is the job of the class. And I have created all kinds of English activities that end up with that. They're in charge of leading all community meetings. They're in charge of, uh, like right now, they develop classes for a middle school that's trying to become a Glasser quality school. It's the job of those kids to design the class for the middle school kids and to go over there and teach it once a week. Um, so they have lots of hands-on kind of activities to make Murray a better place. Um, we also have that as an elective that doesn't have the English part attached to it and we also have a social justice class which you heard spoken about. Um, also we throw it in in everything we do so it isn't just in those classes but that's where they would really get it. Um, I can't sing the idea of quality products enough. I, that it's called a Glasser quality school at first I didn't really get that but that idea of caring about what you do so that you don't want to stop working on it. You love it. You are passionate about it. You want to carry it around. You want everyone to look. That is uh, something that I almost never saw in regular schools. Certainly not attached to a history class or a math class. <laughs> where, where would you do quality products there? But we do. So the goal of Murray is that everyone will do one a year one a year that is to the point of quality and most kids do a lot more than that. Teachers too. I mean for me coming to Ireland that was a quality product for me. I wanted, I had certain goals for that and I wasn't willing to to stop working until I got there. Um, 14 is faculty meetings. We meet all the time. A lot more than regular schools because like you saw with Anna, I mean we're making the decisions about how the school's going to go and we need to talk. You can't do that with somebody standing up in front of you in a meeting once a month telling you this is what we're doing. You have to talk. You get into groups and figure out what your ideas are. And then we take it to the kids, to community meetings. So if we have some big deal that we want to change in the school, we know enough that we better not try to change it over top of them. We need them to understand where we're coming from. And if they really hate it, we probably aren't going to do it. Um, we would definitely need to do more talking and, and chewing on that. Um, community days, my kids have one coming up right now, the leadership team is planning it and they're all excited because they've decided to do a murder mystery for the whole school. So they've got, every, they're going to give out clues all day and in the different classes so you have to be really paying attention to figure out the clue and then by the end of the day you'll be able to figure it out and, um, and it's got all kinds of team building and things in it. We do pancake breakfast, we do ice cream socials, we do anything to help kids kind of love being here. Um, Project-based education, I was talking to some of you about that. The more hands-on things you can do, the better. The more kind of projects they can get their teeth into, the more chance of a quality product. If you're just handing out every day an activity, here's another activity today. Oh, here are two more activities for you to do today. You can't get excited about filling those out. 
You know, just you're covering the curriculum, but you haven't electrified the people who are hopefully trying to learn this. So we would say less of that, because you have to grade all that anyway, or look at it or something, less of that and more where there's a big project that they love and want to do. And will do and ask to do, so that when you come in one day with something to do, they say, aren't we working on the project today? You go, oh yeah, we needed to put time in on that, sorry, okay. I mean, they're helping me manage it, because they love it, they want to do it. Then I know I found a good project, you know, I have to keep tinkering, and all the teachers are doing that. How do, on your um, CD, there's a whole bunch of different lessons from all the different uh, subject area teachers in our building that are the most likely to end up with a quality product. I asked them to send me four or five, and they're all on that CD. So you can take a look at those. Um, let's see, where are we? Uh, 18, differentiation of instruction for student needs and learning styles which is just a big way of saying figure out what everybody needs and help them get it academically. We, we, are the, we have the highest percentage of kids with special education needs in our whole community. Uh, almost 40% this year of our student body. And so that means I might have a class with 90% special ed students. It doesn't matter to us. We don't care about that at all. Uh, because everybody's going to get what they need. I mean, for us, a special ed student is somebody that the government says you have to give them what they need. It's written down on a sheet. Do you have that in Ireland? I don't know. Um, you know, it's written down on a sheet to make the teachers give that kid what they need. It's federal and it's signed off by everybody. You know, we would say, you don't need that. Just give them what they need anyway. Um, just figure that out and, and help them get it. 19 is cooperative learning teams, like you saw here, they designed that themselves, working together as a team. You know, what do we need to do, how do we do it, and they depended on each other, they assigned the tasks to each other, I mean, they ran it, not us. Um, number 20, no, number 20 um, teaching choice theory, we do it everywhere we can all the time. Incomplete makeup days, um, kids said a lot of times we get overwhelmed, there's so much that we have to do, and we can't just say, give me a zero on that and put it aside. We have to do it to a B level. So could we like slow down one day a month and just work on getting this stuff done? Like put in some really intense time, just really focus on getting all our loose ends tied up. And we said, well, what about the kids who are done already? And they said, let them have the day off. And we said, wow, how brilliant that is, yes. And so we instituted that. And once a month, kids who are all done and everything's all finished, they get to go have a good day. And we always make it a Friday, so they get a three-day weekend. And those who aren't done see the reality of not getting your work done on time. You're sitting here while everyone else is on a three-day weekend, but you're getting your work done. So there's a benefit. Um, and those, again, were student ideas that we implemented, and they worked really well. SAT meetings. Student assistance team meeting, which just, you probably have these at your school too, but in our school the student runs it. It means you bring together all the support systems of the school, uh, of the student, like their parents, their um, maybe a psychologist that works with them, the guidance counselor, all their teachers, anybody who they think could help them. And you, you sit at a table together and you say, okay, tell us what you need. What can we do to help you graduate? We're all listening. It has to come out of their mouths. It's their meeting. It's their plan. And they say when they need one. Now, we might say to them, do you need an SAT meeting? Because it's beginning to look to us like you might need one. Have you considered that? So it comes from them. It's not us telling them they have to do it. If a kid says, oh, I don't want to do an SAT meeting, then we say, OK, how are you going to succeed without it? What's your plan? And we listen. If they don't have a plan yet, they know. The minute you ask, what's your plan, and you shut up and listen, mm -hmm. they have an opportunity to realize, God, I don't really have a plan. I have no idea what I'm going to do next. That's a great moment. They just realized it. Instead of you telling them, you've got no plan. There is no chance you are ever going to graduate, kid, the way you're doing. You know, you've got no plan. We combine grade levels and ability levels, which means, I don't know if you do that in Ireland, do you class kids by their abilities, put them in levels? Uh, they do that in all schools in America too, just about, and we don't. Um, 
we just put everybody who wants to be in a class in a class and we meet them where they are. So if I have a senior in a class with a ninth grader, really, that doesn't mean the ninth grader isn't a better writer than the senior. That ninth grader might be spot on and really talented in writing and that senior might be really struggling in writing. So if I want to do a writing lesson, I need to meet all of them where they are and help them move forward. So that's what we do in all different subject areas. Um, combination of, oh, that was that one, inclusion of all special ed students, we don't separate them out. Support of teacher-student interests, for instance, this trip to Ireland, um, I just took nine kids, which is like a tenth of our school, basically, out of the school for a whole week. I had to have support of everybody to do that, and they said, sure, do that, yeah. How did you decide which kids to bring? Oh, they decided. I went to them and said, as in a community meeting at the beginning of the year, we've been invited to Ireland. We've been invited to bring four students and one teacher. How do I pick without hurting somebody? You know, how many of you would like to go? Every hand goes up. I said, so this is the spot I'm in. Everybody laughed. I said, so what do I do? How do we handle this? And so they came up with a plan. They came to me and they said, how about if we just have a meeting? Anybody who wants to come, comes to that meeting. And then at the meeting, you hand out an application. Anybody who wants to come does the application by a certain deadline. And then you take it to the teachers and let them pick the four kids from those applications. And I said, that sounds fair. So we'll try that. 50 kids or so came to the meeting. Nine did the applications on time. I had about 12 who turned in the applications like a week later. You know, got around to it a week later. But I had nine on the deadline that I asked for. And I could not pick between those nine because they were brilliant, they were great, they were passionate and wonderful applications. So I took them to the teachers and said, okay, I got nine, you pick, I can't pick. And they looked at them and they said, take all nine, take them all, they all want to go, let them go. You know? And the main question we had was Shannon, because Shannon had had so many issues with anger in, at school. She had had, from the day she walked in, like a little explosion, which is why she was really enjoying getting a chance to explode on cue this time instead of um, really doing it in her life. But she hasn't exploded like that in a year, maybe a year and a half. And it was an everyday thing for a while. So, you know, the principal, when I went out the door, she said, shut I can't believe Shannon's going with you to Ireland. It's so amazing. It's really great. So, and she's really proud of herself. No one in her family's ever been overseas before, ever. So, she's very excited about it. Are we done? Boys and girls in the school, 50-50-ish? It depends. It changes every year. Yeah, and I, we had one year, we had like 75% boys. It was like, oh my God, how are we going to handle all the fidgeting and body you know, energy and all that? But it went fine. And then some years we have that many girls. It just goes up and down. Same with different... Um, levels of minority, you know, like right now we've got about, we have 12% um, black and Hispanic um, students in our school system, and we have a little bit more than that in our school. So again, that's by word of mouth. That's how kids come to Murray, is by word of mouth. Yeah, and people ask, what is the, the um, stipulation to become a student? You have to apply. And we say, yeah, but we take everybody. <laughs> I mean, you have to apply, yeah, that's all. Yeah, we will take as many as the fire marshal will let us put in the building, which right now is 120. But every time there's pressure from parents to expand the building, there's a whole huge thing the county keeps up in our front hallway, and it's very complicated with all these books and things. They don't want to have to move it, but they're probably going to have to move it and give us that space too. So, you know, we're, we're trying to grow, but there's no, no room to grow us. Yeah. How many teachers have you for the Hunting Tempting? <sighs> I think we have eight or nine full-time teachers and then a bunch of part-timers that come in to do one class here, one class there, because in a small school we have to offer lots of different things. So, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Um, no, it's not that formal. I mean, I, I will ask kids, are you ready to have this one graded? You know, do you think this one's done? You know, tell me why. Is it done? And so it's very, they might say, I'm sick of working on this particular project. I don't want to keep working on this one. Well, that's a good cue for me. There's not much more learning is going to happen on this one. So if I say, no, you have to keep doing that until it's totally 
you know, finished. But I can say to myself as a teacher, okay, that's a practice one. We're not going to count that one. We'll let that one sit for right now. Let me know when you're ready not to do a practice one, one that you want to count. You know, so they're always making decisions about it. And then we use a lot of rubrics and things which I stole from International Baccalaureate and uh, IGCSE uh, and other things because I've taught overseas a lot and ran into a lot of that and thought it was brilliant and really liked it. So I give them rubrics so they can see, you know, what are we looking for? And I have them make rubrics also. You know, what do you think we're looking for in this project? So they can tell me how it's going to be graded. But great, nobody ever asked me for a grade. Nobody ever says, is that an A? I mean, whereas in regular school, kids were constantly like, you know, is this down to this point? And why did, how did I get that? And are you averaging that in? It was like constant fighting over it. And now it's just... We're doing stuff together. It's not really about grades. All right, I'm done. Coffee, coffee. I have lots more stuff on your CD. Look on here if you want to talk to me about it. There's all kinds.